Now, we're at the um, Danny Furnace up in Ohatchee, and this is where they used to make a lot of the uh, cannonballs and cannons and artillery and guns like that, things like that for the Confederate Army. And then when they t overtook Ten Islands, they came here and destroyed Janney Furnace. And that's what one of the things that uh, General Clayton was trying to defend was this place right here. So we're going to take a tour of Janney Furnace. And next door, and they have a museum too. And then next door, they have a Confederate memorial. So we're going to be filming all of that through here. Are Look at this place. Thursday through Monday, 10 to 4. It says right. open. Hello, how are you? Hello. Welcome to Janie Furnace. Hey. hey. We have a moment for me to give you a little story. No. We were having one of our reenactments. By the way, we were having one on uh, 25 and 26 March. Okay. okay. If y'all would like to come back and, and film that. Okay. In addition to the reenactment, we also have our local heroes, uh, John Pell artillerist. Now the story of John Pelham actually, uh, as a young fellow, he, he was fighting under Jeb Stewart mm -hmm. and uh, he was in a lot of battles, but he was killed in 1863. Oh! Important. Mm -hmm. And he was always up in Virginia. That's where he did his stuff. He was genius with artillery. Okay, but then the other thing we had was the reenactment of the Ten Islands skirmish, two-day skirmish, mm -hmm. Ten Islands, uh, between uh, Russo and Clinton. Confederate uh, Clinton. Yes, ma'am. I like you. <laughs> you know this. Thing. I love the history. Uh, up here, when uh, Russo finally crossed the Coosa River and got over and uh, and starting his uh, raid from there on south. One of the first places he wanted to take out was Janie Furnace here. He gave uh, Captain uh, Ruger uh, 300 cavalry and a set of written orders to do that very thing. The 300 cavalry came up and they hit an eight-man militia unit guarding the thing out here. Mm -hmm. And those eight men included two that were in charge. Both of them were over 60 years old. And then the other six Ranged in age from 13 to 16. Wow. So there were children and old men. Oh, yeah. Wow. They came up, uh, the cavalry came up and killed two of the kids. The rest of that unit dropped their arm, just ran like nobody's business in the woods. I personally, as an ex military guy, don't blame them. Mm -mm, right. 300 against eight? No. That's <laughs> stupid. I wouldn't have been there if yes. I had any command to them. But anyway. Uh, they didn't chase them into the woods, though. The cavalry didn't. They turned around, came back carried out their mission, burned down the furnace, dynamited the small chimney. Mm. And then this whole area here around the furnace had a, uh, a mixed race community lived here. You had houses and shacks and livery stables, and grocery store and all that stuff. Well, in the written orders it said to burn the Janney furnace and any buildings that support it. Mm. So, Oh, Ruger decided that, hey, some of those houses down there must have people living in them that worked at the furnace. So in that way, that community was supporting the furnace, so he burns the whole place down. Mm -hmm. It's the brutality of Sherman. It's the mentality. Well, he was he was acting on the uh, reason that Russo was in this area mm -hmm. was Sherman's uh, orders. because of Sherman. Right. Sherman wanted him to use that cavalry to raid southeast across the state of Alabama down to Montgomery mm -hmm. to West Point, Georgia Railroad, tear the railroad up, and this would help Sherman. He was attacking Atlanta at the time. Figured that would keep troops and supplies from coming up to uh, bolster the defense of Atlanta. No, it was a good plan as far as yeah, his side of it. And Rousseau was like, as, to me, was as ruthless almost as Sherman was. He was yeah, well, he was a good buddy with him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why they liked each other, you know. So this furnace was completed in, I think it was 1864. Civil War was going on, and in the last videos that you saw, we were at a cemetery that, that had some of the, the people that were at the battle. But this furnace right here was never fired. That's the furnace right there. 
The Union troops made it down before they had an opportunity to ever fire this furnace. And you could tell when you go up close to it inside, you could see. The inside of it is barred off, so you can see the inside of it. It's just like those cook ovens, the way it's made almost. And going in the, up into a beehive, almost like a shape, and it's got a ledge right there. And the and bricks this that's on this looks very similar to the bricks that were on the inside of those coke ovens down in West Blockton. Yes, they do. And there's the gated entrance that's to the side where I just started. Now, th this entire furnace and area you was get constructed I, I, during that time, you know, mm -hmm. the, the wars were having states. There was a this is the back doctor in this. Tennessee, his name is Dr. Smith, and the story says that he brought his enslaved people, and there was indentured servants and all of that, that this actually the built this. this. Trying to get down without falling. There we go. I'm going to go around to the front side. I can see your shadow coming up. That's the inside of it. We can't actually get up there, but the GoPro can do that for us. Oh, wow, that goes up like a big old smokestack. Yep. That's what I was notating. It's good footage. It's a huge thing. Huge furnace. And they did pig iron here, so... If this would have been in operation at that time, then uh, where we were at in West Blockton would have supplied this this furnace with coke. If it was in operation at the same time, but I don't right. believe that it was. We're going to walk around to the well, museum. When the, when the Union troops came through, the functionality of the furnace was lost. Right, but they, they made sure to shut it down because General Russell's only job was to shut down the furnaces and any weapon manufacturing plants they had. He had to come on. And they said he did his job successfully. We're going to walk by the uh, Confederate Memorial. Okay, it says here that on the two flanking farms are listed the known names of the Calhoun County Confederates who suffered honor and distinction and survived to return to their homes and families after the war for Southern independence ended. That's them. And there is a lot of names in here. There's some Gibbses too. And then it has a memorial to Robert E. Lee. That's a whole lot of names. Wow. And they fought in the war and come on. And then here's the segment on uh, January 11, 1861, the state of Alabama seceded from the Union and joined the Confederate States of America. On April 15, 1861, the United States declared war on the Confederacy. It says Calhoun County lost more men in the war for Southern independence than Alabama's total combined war dead of the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Wow. That's why we have the memorial. Sorry, folks. Oh, you're fine.
There you go, that's what it's all about. Not for fame nor fortune, but in defense of their homes. One of our leaders, John Pellum, 1838 to 1863. Yeah, I had his picture from outside on the memorial. That's a nice, very, very nice memorial. I love the memorial. Mr. Charles Bush. Uh, Bush family had a son, Tom Bush, he's born. And their neighbors, right across the way, pretty close in the same time period, had John Pellon, the Pellon family. Oh. So these three kids, as kids, are <laughs> always together. Oh. As young men, they hunting and fishing together. Pellon's in West Point when the war breaks out anyway, so he's getting away from that. Uh, but over in Jacksonville, the Bush family decides they're gonna help the uh, Confederacy by raising a regiment. They did the 21st Alabama Volunteer Regiment. Wow. Infantry. 1862, we go up to Virginia. They're gonna be part of the Second Battle of Manassas. Okay. Uh, so Tom goes and he takes Charles along with him. And worst of all for Charles, Tom Bush is shot real bad. Mm. So he tries to take care of him. The man knew a whole lot of uh, Indian medicine and stuff. He's using that, trying to get him to cure up. But it's not working too well. He finally decides what he's got to do is get him back home to Jacksonville mm -hmm. to recoup his family. So he takes him, tries to do that, and he gets as far, almost back to Jacksonville, Tom dies. Oh, he gets no. Back. He goes into abject mourning for him. Oh, he's more, no. after a couple of months, his friends are coming around saying, hey, Charles, said you got to stop and he said I don't think I can. They said well if you can't do anything else go join one of these units that's gearing up and go get some payback if that'll do it. Mm -hmm. He stood up and said I can do that. Oh. That guy can fix. He joined the 10th Alabama mm -hmm. Infantry, marched off the war with it, was very quickly made a corporal because he was an excellent soldier. During his uh, time in the service, he cited on three separate occasions for extreme courage in the face of the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, when John Pelham was killed at Kelly Ford, Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Robert E. Lee put together a hand-picked honor guard to take John's body home. Wow. This is one of the soldiers he picked as part of that honor guard. It's not enough for him though. He's not satisfied with that. He goes and searches around on his own and finds John's pistols and his saddle bags. Picks them all up, brings them back to Alabama, gives them back to the Pelham family. Of course, they're ingratiated to him. You see, you lived a long time after mm -hmm. the war. Thank you for the interview here. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Handshake or fist bump? Handshake, that works great for me oh, too. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day and we you appreciate did. your time. Got a little hours. fella right here. Visitor sign in. Well, here we got right here. Confederate soldier. We'll walk up there. It is beautiful out here. A lot of this history people don't even know exists anymore. That's why I'm glad to bring it back to memory to remind people what the Southerners fought for. Oh, that we lost a lot of people in the war too. Yeah, we did. Can't let my legs rest. There you go. Yay, a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> An outhouse, I'll set. You can just leave me here. <sighs> Woo! Now we're gonna look around this log cabin, this museum. Outhouse. I guess this is the way people used to live. This is called the Daniels house. <sighs> right. I wonder if that's the same with the Daniels hooker like we saw up in. Do you know that's what I was just uh, kind of crossed my mind? That we saw up there at Daniel Cemetery? Because that's really not that far from here, from no, where we're No, and they didn't make a housing museum dedicated to them. Right. I wonder if this is it. 
Okay, I'm gonna take some pictures and look over here. It says, the Daniel House was built around 1843 near Bowling Springs Church, five miles from the Jenny Furnace. It was almost destroyed in April's tornado in 2011. Then they donated it. This is them. Okay, this is the house. Oh, wow. It's not a section for you, babe. I don't know if you can go in there. Right? No, it's locked. We'll walk around it. It's a beautiful looking house. Home. I love the stonework on the chimney. Yes. Looks like they have a a smokehouse and an owl house. And under the right conditions, both of them were smoking. Oh. That'd be great. All right. This is the smokehouse. You got dogs coming up. You see inside, they used to have these like wires being set up. Guess you don't have to have a very big smokehouse. And this is your owl house. Occupied. What? Occupied. <laughs> Oh, back when we did John Hayes' house, I commented on the glass, but here you go again. You see how the glass? Yeah. You can see through it, but it's, it's, it looks flat, but it's not pretty flat. You can see inside. There's all the wavy lines. I don't know if you can see in there or not. This is, this yeah, is, you can. Yeah, I'd be is, like that. It's an original old piece of glass. That's what it looks like from looking in to the cabin. The cabin. And then I guess back here might be where they said they have weddings and stuff. Yeah. Things like that. Instead of taking it out for that. See Rock City. This is a good little, it's a beautiful place. It really is. I love that cabin. I do. Yes. Well, there's one other story too that comes out of here. Just a little story about Lincoya. Okay. That's, uh, you know, who Lincoya was. He was mm -hmm. I don't. General uh, Andrew Jackson's adopted son. No, you got me on that one. I couldn't even. Not I, I, knew, I knew Andrew Jackson's adopted, adopted children, children, but I didn't son. know. He was a Creek Indian boy. He survived, the, just barely survived the uh, battle. Is that why he adopted him? He, it's kind of unknown. The whole thing was, Jackson wasn't even at the battle. He had sent uh, his cavalry commander, uh, Colonel uh, John Coffey, down there. Led down there, by the way, by Davy Crockett, which we think is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But he gets down there, there's roughly 900 cavalry against uh, an estimated 500 warriors. And it was pretty, the warriors didn't have any firearms. They had sent out people to buy them from different places they hadn't got back with them yet, which is part of Jackson's plan to get them before they got This child, this little boy, he was about 10 months old, his mother was dead, she died from smoke inhalation, 
and fallen on him. Oh. And apparently that saved his life. Mm -hmm. Coffee coming around with roll the woman over here's this live baby boy. He picks him up, takes him to uh, to the uh, women, the mm -hmm. creek women. Said, hey, it's a creek baby. One of you women need to take him. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. said, Why not? So he killed his, well, he killed his parents, his mm -hmm. grandparents. Nobody left of his family but him. So he's only 10 months old. And, uh, but it's a, their, their resolution was to let the family line die out. Well, no, what they were going to do, according to their beliefs, pick up all the dead family members, put them in one spot on sacred ground, and then they were going to take the baby, put him right in the middle, and let the family spirits watch over the baby. they take care of him, and then these go on. And Coffee just, he'd seen too much of uh, the He'd never seen a lot of women and children hurt on a battle like he had on this one. Uh, and he just said, uh, no. <laughs> he got the baby, he gave him one of his lieutenants. He sent him back up to Jackson, who was in Fort Strother. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but Fort Strother is about five and a half miles back this way, or it was. It was there. But take the baby in to Jackson, and the only way I describe it here, the only way I can think of describing it, is that a miracle took place. Because Jackson turned around, looked at the baby, and just fell in love with it. And you got to figure, Jackson's red-headed, he's Irish background, he's bad-tempered, and he doesn't like Indians very much. But That's for some fun. reason, he just saw that baby, gave him a creek name, Muskogee name, um, and quite a, it meant a little stranger, uh -huh. and wrote a letter to his wife, Becky, of Tennessee, sent the kid up to her, said, take care of this kid, he's Irish now. <laughs> or words wow. to that. Oh, wow, so, wow. That's what I'm doing when I'm out on the road. Oh, no, you're not seeing a kid in a letter. And then, he, and then, he, and then he, uh, he later on gave him a second name, Jackson. He adopted him, raised him as his own son. Yeah. All right, sir. Well, thank you so much for time. I, I hope we broke up your day a little bit. You did. All thank right, you. sir. Hey, you have a wonderful day. And again, thank you. We'll be seeing you again. Okay, I appreciate it. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you, folks. All right. Wow, that was a that hill got me. I like my mop made it up. Yeah, it was a little bit of a walk for me too, baby.